At this time, I want to introduce Amanda Tall. Let me tell you about her. I got a text message. I can't even, you can get on up here. I can't even remember if it was a phone call or text message. But when I read what she had to say, I was like, oh, we got to get a hold of this woman. But I'm so thankful she came up. I got an opportunity to hear her testimony here oh, about two months ago down in Alton when, when uh, Brother Reverend, uh, Brother and Reverend and Chaplain, and I'm just going to give you every title in the world. Mark Lane had a, uh, uh, basically a cookout, but it focused on prison. He, uh, this year he's been doing an emphasis on prison ministry, and I appreciate that so much. But I got to hear her testimony, and while she's giving her testimony, I can't remember if it was Scott or Les. I think it was you, Scott, wasn't it? Or Les, one of them came over and whispered in my ear, we need to have her give a testimony. So <laughs> I immediately texted her later on and said, we want you. So it's her anniversary today. So happy anniversary, Gabriel. Yeah, and you know, you know you love God whenever on your anniversary, you come to a little itty bitty town like Herrick, Illinois and give your testimony. So man, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. My husband says I'm a little extra because I had to have this because I had a bad experience one time. I was looking down and my head hurt and I couldn't flip the pages right. So, all right. Well, what's up Forever Family? My name is Amanda. I am a grateful born again believer and follower of Jesus Christ. And I am so excited to share that I will be celebrating four years of recovery on September 4th. From alcohol and drug addiction and everything else that comes with that kind of lifestyle, such as jail and prison. Praise God. So before I get started, I just wanna thank God for his faithfulness in my life and just for his amazing grace. It's, that's why I'm here today. So I just want to say thank you, Jesus, and also thank you, Brother Bill, for allowing me to share my rescue story and to everyone else for being here today. All you guys are awesome, and all your, all your work is just amazing, and it's just an honor for me to be here today. So let's just open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your, and praise you for your love and your mercy in our lives. I thank you, Lord, that while I was yet a sinner, you sent your son to die for me. I didn't deserve it, but you gave me your amazing grace anyway, and it's by your stripes that I'm healed. Father, as I reveal my past, I ask for your strength to be made perfect in my weakness. Thank you for this opportunity to share my story. May it bring you glory and hope to the person in need. I pray and ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. So, I grew up in Alton, Illinois. I am the youngest of four and the only child with a different dad who is unknown to this day. I am also the only child born with brown hair, brown eyes, and dark skin. So since I can remember, I've always felt like the oddball of the bunch. When I would ask my mom questions about who my dad was, she would always tell me, not right now, Amanda, I have a headache. Well, he must have really done a number because she still has a headache to this day. The closest thing I had to a father figure growing up was my grandpa. We were super close. I mostly stayed with him when my mom worked and would move in and out with my siblings. But when they were there, I was teased and picked on a lot by them because of my grandpa's favoritism toward me. He held a special place in his heart for me and had a hard time telling me no. So my siblings were always putting me up to something to either get their way or get me in trouble. And I would do just about anything to earn their love and approval. Needless to say, at a very early age, I learned how to manipulate and people please to get my needs met. I idolized my older sister growing up. She was beautiful, funny, smart, and popular. She always got all the attention. Whereas being the baby of the family, I always felt left out and unheard. I remember following my sister around, trying to look like her to fit in and hang out with her and her cool friends, especially her boyfriends. They were always nice to me and I loved the attention. So I thought until age nine, when my innocence was taken from me by my sister's older boyfriend. When I told her she was upset and cried, she even screamed at him over the phone, but then turned around and told me it was basically my fault for being a little tease and wearing tight clothes around him. Unfortunately, I believe that lie, and I blame myself for what had happened. I never told anyone else. I realize now how this played a huge part with my sexual promiscuity starting at such an early age. I don't recall ever going to church with my family as a child other than when my mom sent me on the Sunday school bus a couple of times. 
There was very little structure or rules to follow growing up. My grandpa tried his best, he really did, but he was just getting too old to keep up. I started skipping school, running away, and hanging out with older crowds. By age 13, I was drinking, smoking weed, and experimenting with acid and cocaine. Around age 14, I ran away and met this lady who had her own apartment. She would have a lot of parties with a lot of guys coming over, and she would let me drink and use drugs with her. She would always dress me up, do my hair and makeup, and make me look really pretty, and much older, might I add. One time she told me about these rich guys that she knew, and then explained to me how we can make some money. Before I knew better, even knew what the word meant, I was engaging in prostitution. I was introduced to prominent businessmen and lawyers in the area. I started making fast money, and the love of money and greed began to fill temporary voids in my life. I may not have had a daddy, but I found sugar daddies that would give me their time and attention and buy me everything I thought I needed to feel loved and wanted. You see, deep down, I always craved that love and affection, but this was the wrong kind. I was using my body and looks to get the attention, and soon after, it left me feeling used and dirty inside. As my life became a nightmare of sexual abuse, and drug use to escape the emotional pain of my reality. By age 15, I was stripping at a nightclub in Paducah, Kentucky. And from there, I ended up stranded in downtown Manhattan in a horrible situation where I was forced to grow up real fast to survive. By the grace of God, I made my way out of that alive and found my way back home. On my sweet 16th birthday, I dropped out of high school. Life was a huge party for me. I had a fake ID and I spent a lot of my time at the bars where I became that seductress woman in Proverbs that the Bible clearly warns men to stay away from. As I got older, my addiction progressed with my drinking, especially after my grandpa died. Um, When he died, it took a huge part of me with him and I didn't know how to cope with that kind of loss. We never discussed our feelings or showed much affection in our family. So I continued to use drugs to escape my reality and numb the pain until age 19 when I got pregnant. I've had four beautiful children by four different men with four different stories to tell. I don't have time to share all that with you. You'd be here all day. Those are other testimonies. (laughs) But what I can share with you is the patterns of unhealthy choices and relationships I've experienced due to the baggage I've carried around with me. For a long time, I lived in fear of rejection and abandonment due to my father's absence in my life. Yes, I had daddy issues and a distorted view of God because of that. I had deep roots of bitterness, resentment, and hatred towards men I had built up. You see, men couldn't be trusted in my eyes. They only wanted one thing from me and it wasn't my heart. So I put up walls. I always thought men owed me something, but nothing they offered was ever enough to pay for all the damage that was done over the years. And because of this, I was never able to stay in a committed relationship for very long. But somehow, I thought that having a family would fix everything and I would try my best to hold it together and be a good mom but there was another pattern and vicious cycle that would soon follow. In CR, we call these hurts, hangups, and habits. And about a year after or so, my children were, about a year or so after my children were born, I would eventually, unfortunately, I'm sorry, be in and out of their lives due to my drug addiction and lifestyle of criminal behavior. Altogether, I've been arrested 32 times and have been convicted of 13 felonies. I've served a total of 11 years in prison and I've done both state and federal time. You would think I was some hardcore criminal, but really I just had a hardcore addiction and I couldn't get a grip on my life. One thing I've learned for sure is obviously that I'm a terrible criminal, Jeez! But besides all that, after you've been to prison once, it's really easy to go back. It's like a revolving door. I was sent back to prison mostly on violations of my parole due to having dirty urine drops and the majority of my charges and convictions are all drug-related and nonviolent offenses. So for a long time, I would use this for an excuse to blame the system and everyone else for failing to help me in ruining my life. And I stayed stuck in denial. There were also other factors that played a role in my blaming. While incarcerated in 2005, my oldest daughter's father committed suicide when she was only five. And in 2007, I was back in prison on another violation but this time I was pregnant and I gave birth to my youngest son in a federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas. Shackled to a bed, I had him for only three precious days before they took him from me. 
This would be one of the hardest things I would ever endure in my entire life. Make no mistake, prison is very hard. It can either make you or break you. It's a whole different world on the inside. There are a lot of unfair and unjust things that go on unseen and unheard of. You lose every right you thought you had and you are completely lost and cast out of society. There you become just a number and we become labeled for life. However, as bad as I don't like to admit it, my, incarcer my incarcerations were not all bad. You see, prison was the only place where I could get sober and reflect on my life. It was the only place where I had structure and learned how to follow rules. Prison is where I got some college education and drug treatment. It's where I was humbled and I learned gratitude and patience, even a sense of respect for authority figures. But the absolute best thing that ever happened to me while I was locked up was when I found God and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. During my incarcerations, I would spend a lot of time in God's word, searching and seeking him with all my heart and praying. It was like God's personal timeouts for me. And it still amazes me how God was always right there, faithfully waiting and ready to reveal himself and comfort me. And to be honest, I still sometimes struggle with how I could have known God and yet turned my back on him so many times. Shortly after I got out, I've heard some say it was because it was a jailhouse religion, while others, was, others said it was because I was never saved in the first place. But I would like to think differently in my heart, for God is sovereign and the only one who truly knows the plans he has for us. I am far from having all the answers, but I was led to Matthew chapter 13, verses five through 23, where Jesus taught the, ter the, sorry, the parable of the four soils and the farmer that sowed the seed. The four soils represent the four conditions of the heart and our state of readiness to respond to God's word and will. I believe Jesus shared this parable to help people like me better understand that there's a heart, there's a change of heart process, and it's different for each person. I truly believe my heart went through a little of each condition before the seed landed on good soil and started producing good fruit in my life. Now, for those of you that don't understand what it's like to relapse or backslide, I will try to explain my experience. I compare it to Luke eleven twenty six, 26, where Jesus taught us about an evil spirit leaving someone, but coming back after, finding the person's life swept clean and unoccupied by the Holy Spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then it brings with it seven more evil spirits causing the condition of that person to be worse off than before. And this is what would happen to me. Each time I got clean, I would find God and then turn away. Each backslide and relapse only gets worse. Before my last incarceration, I was at my absolute worst condition. The alcohol, cocaine, Pills and meth had taken a toll on me. I had cut all my hair off and bleached it blonde to disguise myself. I weighed 100 pounds soaking wet, face sunk in, and the bags under my eyes told a story that my strength was almost gone. I was strung out and I was losing my mind. And the devil had me right where he wanted me, feeling separated from God, hopeless, and wanting to die. I had gotten myself into so much trouble with the law again, and this time I burnt every bridge I could possibly burn and made myself enemies on both sides of the fence. I was in deep and I was running out of places to go. My family still loved me, but I knew deep down they had given up on me a long time ago, and I think I did too. I had tried everything I could think of to fix things on my own, and I had failed miserably each time. Does anyone know what we call this in CR? Insanity. On September 4, 2018, I was arrested and facing 10 years in prison. Let me just say, it took about three months of sitting in Madison County Jail before I could even think clearly enough to understand what was really going on. But when the fog did clear, there was no words to describe the unbearable disgust and disappointment I felt about myself. I was humiliated and ashamed. I had fit, hit the very bottom of my rock bottoms and there was no one left to blame but me. But let me tell you, it was there at my very bottom in my weakest moment where I found Jesus to be my rock and God's grace to be sufficient for me. 
You see, I didn't realize it until I worked through the steps of CR that I had been holding on to past hurts and blaming others for so long that there was a little girl inside of me raging out of control. I hadn't been fighting all these battles that weren't mine to fight and I just couldn't fight anymore. I remember one night going back to my cell and falling on my knees, crying out. I was so tired of running from God and carrying all the weight of my sin. It was too heavy for me. And I remember in Matthew eleven twenty eight, where Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And it was there on that cold jail cell floor when all my hope was gone and everyone had given up on me that I realized just how great his love for me was and how he had been there all along waiting on me with open arms, ready and willing to forgive me and take me back just as I was. After all I had done, all he wanted from me in return was my heart something I hadn't given to any man. But Jesus wasn't just any man. He was the only man that never left me or used me or forsaken me. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks and my walls came crumbling down. And I realized that unlike any others, Jesus owed me nothing. And he, yet he paid it all for me. And there was nothing I could do to earn that or separate his love for me. That's God's amazing grace. And that's how he won my heart and snapped my chains for good. I repented of my sins and I surrendered my life that night. And I mean, I surrendered it all. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 6, to submit your ways to the Lord and he will make your path straight. So I did. And I promised to serve Jesus with all my heart wherever I went as long as he went with me. So what happened after that was amazing. God opened my eyes and my heart to everything around me and gave me a burning desire to help those that I could rate to, relate to the most. Over the next seven months while awaiting sentencing, I started reading and studying my Bible like never before and taking Bible study courses through the mail. I was given my first CR Bible and I knew instantly this was where God was calling me. The Holy Spirit then led me to step up where no one else was and start doing Bible studies with the ladies on my cell block. Together with only one CR Bible, we went through the 12 steps and eight principles. On March 12, 2019, I was sentenced to six and a half years to IDOC. I was transferred to Decatur Correctional Center where I reached out to a local church with a Celebrate Recovery and I got connected. God provided me with an amazing sponsor who came to visit me and supported me while I led a step study with the ladies on my unit. It took about six months to work through our steps and complete, but we did it, and we all received certificates from CR Decatur, Illinois. Yeah. In November 2019, I was transferred to a work release program in Aurora, Illinois. From there, I reached out and I found another local church with another Celebrate Recovery and was blessed with another amazing sponsor. She also came to visit me and she helped me continue to work on my recovery. If you notice, there was, there's a different pattern going on for once in my life, I cared more about getting connected with God and his people, the church and recovery more than anyone or anything else. And God honored that so much that on August 5th, 2020, due to COVID and I believe God's favor, I was granted a furlough to come home from prison and work. And thanks to my beautiful daughter who opened up her heart and home to me, I was able to be with her and my precious grandbabies and start my life over. So during this time that COVID had everything shut down, it was hard for me to attend church or CR, but I reached out to Alton's best chaplain, Brother Mark, while I was still in work release, and he helped form a support team for me through CR Alton and helped me transition even more. And when I tell you he is amazing, I mean it with all my heart. Thank you, Brother Mark. He also told me about another CR in Granite City, so when time permitted, I got connected with both CRs and started attending Restoration Church in Granite. Um, de on December 27, 2020, I made a public declaration of my recommitment to Christ and was baptized with my 10-year-old daughter who wanted to commit to a new life with me. <laughs> yeah, is that awesome or what? Breaking generational curses, amen? God is a way maker. He even made a way for me to move to Granite City so I could be close to my church and my CR family. And with the help from my generous hearted brothers and sisters who helped renovate and clean up my apartment, I was able to move in with no money down or rent to pay for the first four months. 
What a blessing. I mean, that's huge for someone just getting out. And for me especially, for the first time, I was able to get on my own two feet without using my body or manipulation. I remember thinking, wow, these guys really do love Jesus. <laughs> this is truly a God thing. So after that, I took suggestions and I stayed single for the first year. Not easy, but necessary, so I could focus on my walk with Jesus and rebuilding relationships with my family and children. It's now been two years that I've been home and what an amazing journey it has been with God in my life. It hasn't all been easy, but it's been so worth it, and God has been my strength and provider each step of the way. He even provided me with an amazing husband, which is another testimony down the road, but real quick, Gabe, my husband, and I were former addicts together, we committed crimes together, and we got locked up together, but God was not finished with us yet, amen? Long story short, <laughs> Gabe and I both have committed, we have both, wait, Gabe and I have both given our lives to Christ and seek to put him first. My husband has been my biggest supporter and I am so blessed to be his wife. And by the way, it is our anniversary, so happy one year, babe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we both know we still have a long way to go, but we are building on a foundation on the rock of ages and we're growing in Christ daily and we have an amazing support system and church family to thank for that. With God, all things are possible. So much so that on January 15, 2022, we launched our very own landscaping business and it's doing great. God is amazing. We went from former drug addicts and criminals together to born again believers and business owners. <laughs> And it gets better. Our closest best friends and business partners are our pastor and his beautiful wife. Just amazing people. God is so good. I couldn't make this up. <laughs> and it's just so amazing how he has worked behind the scenes for our good this whole time. I mean, let's face it, guys. The odds were against me, just like they are so many others that are locked up right now. Nobody thought I could change but God. And he threw me a lifeline called Celebrate Recovery and I grabbed a hold with both hands that I haven't let go since. And what helped me change the most was when I started working the 12 steps and applying the eight principles to my life. First, I realized how powerless I was and how I had been playing God for so long in my life. I was then able to step straight out of denial and stop blaming everyone for everything and I started taking responsibility of my own actions. I began to dig deep by taking inventory, and I started confessing my sins to others. I started writing letters, even to God, making amends and offering forgiveness to others that wronged me, and that's where my true healing began. Now it's all about daily inventory, accountability partners, and giving back what God has so graciously given to me, my freedom on the inside. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Real quick before I close, I would like to share a part of this CR devotional I found titled, Change is Possible. When we get to that place of surrender where we can say to God, I'm tired of doing this on my own, then we can begin the process of allowing him to change us. No matter what we find ourselves in the middle of, no matter what poor choices we've made, no matter what struggles or hurts we've experienced, God still loves us and desires to comfort, protect, and guide us out of our mess and pain. In the process, he teaches us how to live more fruitfully. And I've learned that God never, ever wastes a hurt. And because of that, it has now become my heart's desire and passion to go back inside and share this message of hope and freedom that I have found in Jesus with others that were like me, lost and broken and in need of forever family. It is all in God's timing, so please keep me in prayer for that approval. But for those of you that can get approved, please pray and get involved in CR Inside. Somehow, some way, you could really help change someone's life. God has been so good to me. He is restoring everything the devil intended would destroy me, and I am so grateful I get another chance to be the best mom and grandma I can and wife with God's help. I don't know where I'd be, if I wouldn't have gotten arrested this last time, surrendered my entire life to Christ, got that first CR Bible, or had all the support from my forever family throughout my entire journey up until now. But I know God did, and I am forever grateful that, for that, and I am grateful for all of you. Thank you for letting me share. 